Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Spoiler alert, this is not a holly jolly Christmas sermon. Why not? Well, for one thing, because it's just the second Sunday of Advent, and also because our Bible reading from Joel is not a holly jolly Christmas text. In fact, it's a text we usually hear on Ash Wednesday, not during December. But to me, it really seems to work in Advent this year. So though I make no promises for a holly jolly sermon today, I think it might be worth sticking around anyway. The whole first chapter of Joel sounds like a horror movie, talking about how plagues of locusts have utterly destroyed the land. Joel 1 says, What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. After one swarm of locusts after another, they laid waste to everything. It left the land, animals, and people devastated. And the locusts were on top of all the other struggles that they already had. They had lost the promised land, lost their temple and been shipped off to a foreign land. By this time, some of the exiles had been, able to, been allowed to return to Jerusalem, but now it was occupied territory, and their land wasn't their own anymore, and it felt like God wasn't even there. So the endless swarms of locusts felt like the last straw in an already awful time. What other horrible things could happen during an already horrible time? How much more could they take? Does that sound familiar? We're dealing with a pandemic which has brought fear, uncertainty, sickness, hospitalizations, quarantines, unemployment, social distancing, virtual everything, businesses closing, cancellations, disappointments, loneliness, a devastating number of deaths, and insufficient ways to say goodbye to those we've lost. Many of us haven't seen family and friends who we desperately miss, and we're aching to be able to do the things that give life meaning, especially at this time of year. Feels like enough to deal with, right? But then in our country, we've also had racial violence and rioting, social and political division, murder hornets, and more named hurricanes than any other year, and record-shattering wildfires. Now we're going into the darkest, coldest time of the year. How much more can we take? See, I told you this wasn't going to be a holly jolly Christmas sermon. So this year, more than any other, maybe we can relate to the people who Joel, Joel was talking to. We, too, are in the midst of plagues on top of crises, on top of, top of disasters, with little idea of when it will get better. We're not sure of how to deal with all this. So the last year has been very much about just surviving. So maybe it would help to hear the wisdom of others who have endured and survived and even thrived during similar times. Joel has some of that wisdom for us today. He says, yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, rend your hearts and not your clothing. I'm guessing that doesn't really make things crystal clear to you, so let's translate it into our own context. When things aren't going well for us, whether it be because of a disaster, because we've failed at something, because we're depressed or lonely, or because life just isn't going our way, our culture tells us that more is the answer. Having more, doing more, eating more, drinking more, planning more will make things better. Filling our lives, filling our homes, our bellies, our agendas with more things will fill that empty feeling inside us. We Americans are really good at that. Fill the emptiness. Treat yourself. Distract yourself with something fun, new, loud, pretty, or delicious. You'll forget about whatever was troubling you. 
But the life advice in Joel is almost completely the opposite. Joel's people were going through some terrible things. Some of those things were their own fault, but many of them were disasters outside their control. And rather than encouraging his people, don't worry, be happy, get a massage, buy yourself something fun, treat yourself, drown the pain in the world around you, Joel says, empty yourself. Don't surround yourself with stuff and people and noise. Don't distract yourselves from how you're feeling. Be real. Turn to God with your pain. And try fasting. Try weeping and mourning. Try tearing your heart instead of your clothing. But what strange advice that is to us, isn't it? Fasting? Who does that these days? Well, dieters and those prepping for a colonoscopy, I suppose. But fasting for God? Why? And we'd rather not weep or mourn, at least not in front of other people. We don't rend or tear our clothing or our hearts for that matter. Are Joel's words relevant to us at all? One December, I spent extra amounts of time trying to make Christmas meaningful for my family and for my congregation. I wanted everybody to have a uniquely special experience and to connect with God in powerful ways. I worked extra hours, I spent extra money, I prepared extra music, made extra treats, hung extra direct decorations. And after Christmas, I was extra exhausted and feeling strangely empty. Why? I had done everything I could to fill Christmas with meaning. The next few weeks were also rough and life-sapping. And in mid-January, I went to a pastor's retreat. I had no energy, nothing to share. I hadn't even finished the homework I was supposed to do before I got there. I was just completely worn out, empty, and useless. I had nothing left to give. So when at the retreat we were asked to partner up and talk to somebody, I quietly slipped out and went and sat in the chapel by myself to think. The previous month had left me feeling beat down and unappreciated, and nothing I did felt right. It felt like I needed something, but I didn't know what I needed. As I sat there alone in tears, I listened to the song that was playing softly in the background. What we need is He. What we need is He. That phrase just repeated over and over again. What we staring up at the cross up front, and suddenly I started to laugh. I'd spent so much time and energy in the last month helping other people connect meaningfully with God, but I hadn't taken the time to do my own connecting with God. What I needed was there. I just needed to push away the other stuff, all my expectations and distractions, all the extra stuff I was doing so that I could see the God that I needed. In that moment, I re recognized my emptiness needed to be filled not with fun or food or doing things for others, but with the God who had been standing there waiting for me to take the time to just be open. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's really what Joel's advice is about here. Amid the pain of the current time, what we haven't lost is the God who is everything that we need. Joel encourages us to push aside the distractions, all the stuff that gets in our way and blocks our view of God, and focus instead on what's real and simple. We need to eat, but fasting reminds us to be more mindful about what and how and when we eat. 
As we fill our bodies, we invite God to fill our spiritual hunger. We spend a lot of time pretending that things are okay, that we're okay, that we're handling things just fine, but Joel encourages us to be real with ourselves. Life is hard right now. We need to cry, to scream even, to lament about our pain, to give it to God to help us get through it. Joel tells us to rend our hearts, not our clothing. And while tearing our clothing in grief isn't something we do in our culture, we do focus a lot on our outsides, our appearance, our clothing, our homes. Joel encourages us not to worry so much about the externals of our lives as much as about what's on the inside of us. God doesn't care so much about how we look or dress or decorate as much as he cares about who we are and how he can connect more deeply with us. God cares about our hearts. God wants our hearts, our real, authentic selves, rather than any of the stuff we fill our emptiness with. When we turn to God, when we acknowledge our pain and emptiness, God is there to fill us, to comfort us, to bless us in ways we could never imagine. Because if you look at today's whole reading, it's a promise, it's a blessing. If you return to God, turn to God with your whole heart, not just the happy parts, but the weeping part. Fasting from whatever keeps you from connecting, mourning honestly what is to be mourned, then God will pour his spirit on all people. This has been a profoundly difficult year. We're in a time of the year that we usually fill with music and food, parties, gifts, decorations, and joy. But this year may limit our ability to fill our lives with those things. So it seems like the perfect year to simplify, to look at what's truly meaningful, truly real. I encourage you to not just look at what we don't have, what we can't do, but look inside yourself and realize that what you can do is take some time to reconnect with the God who pours the Holy Spirit into you and fills you from the inside out. What we need is here. No, we can't be here together as we would like to this year. But Jesus was born to be Emmanuel, God with us wherever we are. So, what we need is here. God is born in a manger, walking among us, dying on a cross, here in the meal that we share. What we need is here in our lives, through the voices of loved ones, through our tears and our laughter, through the prayers and blessings of our community of faith that transcends just this place. What we need is here. So let us open our hearts to God's presence and being exactly what we need. Amen.